Greetings, my kings, queens, and lieges. My name is Hanna Tarakawa, Dragon Girl at your service. And today I will be reviewing the Sultan's Ascend expansion for Age of Empires 4. Before we start, I would like to first uh, apologize for the audio quality. I'm using a voice changer for what uh, you can guess are obvious reasons, but I hope that my voice is still clear to you and that you will be able to enjoy this video. The way I present this review may also be a little bit rambly, but it is simply the way I think and I hope that it will still be clear and understandable to you. As a relatively new streamer and YouTuber, I wish to talk a bit more about my history with RTS and the Age of Franchise. I started playing RTS games when I was uh, very young, seven years old even, and I have been hooked on them ever since, from StarCraft 1, Age of Empires 2, Age of Mythology, uh, up until today where I'm playing StarCraft 2, Age of Empires 4, and many other RTS games. I have a huge breadth of experience with the genre as well as decent skills, considering that I have managed to attain master's rank in StarCraft II 1v1 ladder for a decently long amount of time. Now, uh, that aside, when it comes to the Age of franchise, I was actually never the biggest fan of Age of Empires II. It was a good game, I enjoyed it. But today, if I could pick between Age of Empires 2 and StarCraft 1, for example, I would pick StarCraft 1 every time. That, however, is a personal preference. On the other hand, Age of Mythology is a game that I absolutely adore, and it is a game that I am very, very excited that it will get its uh, remake, at least as far as we know. It's something between a remake and a remaster. When it comes to Age of Empires 4, I had zero expectations with it. I was very, very much of the opinion that I will be pleasantly surprised if it was decent and not much else. And when I played it, actually, I was shocked. I absolutely loved how the game worked. I loved the mechanics of it. I loved playing it at every opportunity uh, from the moment I got into the beta for it and I have been selling the game for a long time after that. I still do. I love Age of Empires 4 and that love only increased with its campaign because the story campaign once it was released all of the uh, major campaigns that is the Mongolian, the Russian, the English and the French campaigns they were all amazing to me, from the gameplay side of things, to the documentaries, additional historical context, even up to the bits that you learn in the masteries uh, for the game that kept me playing for a while. That said, I had decided against going really hard into the multiplayer 1v1 scene because I did not want to commit to playing 1v1 for a long time and I simply shifted my attention to other games and other genres, but my love for Age of Empires 4 has persisted. I would return to the game for a little while with the Ottomans and the Malians, uh, which was very fun to experience. I really like the Malians. The Malian specific mechanics are really fun to explore, especially when it came to their base building around the gold mines. Well, the Ottomans were fine to me, not particularly amazing, but I still liked them. I still thought they were a breath of fresh air and I enjoyed what they brought to the game. That brings us to the Sultan's Ascend. And the Sultan's Ascend as a campaign was something that I was also very much looking forward to as the first story expansion to the game. I was hoping that it would be good and that I would enjoy it just like I've enjoyed the other campaigns. I was looking forward to the documentaries, to the historical stuff, 
and uh, well my expectations were not quite met let me put it like that i will elaborate more in detail later on what i mean by that the irony of that is that i am actually going to give a very high final score for the expansion but that is in line with me keeping the score of the expansion more objective based than uh, my own personal preferences based however my preferences will be clear to you by the end of this video so to start off with would be the positives and there are many many positives to the Sultan's Ascendant expansion. First off, let's start with the more multiplayer side of things, which would be the new variant civilizations and the new civilizations. Uh, first off, I would uh, say that I had only spent a small amount of time on the Jushi and the Ayubids uh, civilizations. They were not quite as attractive to me, but they were a refreshing way of playing their original civilizations, meaning the Chinese and the Abbasids, respectively. I spent some more time on the two civilizations that interested me more, that would be Order of the Dragon and Jean d'Arc. Order of the Dragon felt really, really interesting to play. It felt in several ways like the Nova co-op commander in StarCraft 2 with high value units that were very expensive and that even took up uh, twice as much pop cap or population cap as uh, regular units, which I thought was a very, very good way of limiting the player in the amount of troops that uh, they can have while also still keeping up with the way that the faction is meant to be played and uh, they also look really really cool like just look at the knights or the footman it's so good and um, i would definitely recommend people to try it out i would recommend people to try out all of the civilizations to be clear but order of the dragon gets my personal preference as my favorite and the last variant civilization would be jean d'arc and that is a civilization that surprisingly to me stirred up a decent bit of controversy partially for the name of it and partially for the gameplay side of things and I did not feel that way at all. Maybe that is uh, because of my past with StarCraft II co-op, but Jean d'Arc also played in a different way, similar to uh, Nova or uh, any of the other hero-based co-op commanders in StarCraft II. You had Jean who would be gaining experience throughout the match by doing things. Uh, for example, when she starts as a villager, she has to do villager-like things to be able to get enough experience to progress to becoming a foot soldier and then later she would have to defeat uh, enemies alongside the army to get experience to become either a uh, either a knight with some support directly or a knight that buffs units around her and all of it was really really interesting really engaging you are very very much encouraged to use Jean d'Arc as much as possible even if she dies and uh, her dying isn't necessarily the worst thing ever because although there is a long cooldown to her respawning in the game you can actually pay tribute aka a certain amount of gold to get her back immediately and that is a very good mechanic i really like that they have thought of that to use for Jean d'Arc so that um, she can be on the field as much as possible and as much as it is convenient for you when you use her. Essentially, she also gets a lot of positives from me because I think it's a very, very creative way of doing a um, French variant civilization that also has a hero-based main character, main focus. Then we come to the two new civilizations, which also have their own unique mechanics. The Japanese in particular have 
uh, two specific mechanics that I really like. Uh, one would be the shinobi. The shinobi are meant to be used so that uh, they disguise themselves as villagers of a different faction and then they sabotage things in the opponent's base. It is uh, very, very fun to play, very fun to use, and uh, I would encourage people to do that because it is very annoying for someone who is defending against that to actually have to deal with it. In addition to that, I really like the banner system. It encourages you to have several town centers that are very well upgraded to use castles the least amount of possible, and that makes you have more uh, powerful units uh, that can be a varied amount of units you can have uh, powered up banner archers, powered up uh, foot soldiers, powered up uh, essentially knights and I, I really enjoyed that. I think it's a good way to make a specialist style of army without uh, having it be overbearing and the other units that you have can also pick up those banners which means that you don't necessarily need to train the new banner units you can simply have other units pick that up which as a comparison is similar to the phoenix uh, co-op commander in which units can take on the role of a different uh, main commander that you can uh, research in one of the Phoenix uh, special structures. Uh, another thing that I've enjoyed about the Japanese faction is that they have uh, two special female units, uh, the Ona Bugeisha and the Ona Musha. The Ona Bugeisha are foot soldiers who wield the Naginata, a Japanese style spear, while the Ona Musha were horse archers. In general, Onamusha means female war. I really appreciate Relic trying to highlight prominent women in uh, various societies across the world. Uh, last but not least, not by a long shot, would be the Byzantines with their own specific mechanics. For example, they have the mercenary companies, which means that you can hire certain units of different styles, specifically picking between Western eastern or uh, southern mercenaries if i recall correctly and uh, they are varied in uh, what they do essentially byzantines can take on mercenaries of different civilizations and it is a very cool way of diversifying your army forces and army composition in addition to that there is the olive oil mechanic specifically uh, farms for the Byzantines are not just farms, they are olive groves and you also get olive oil as a specific resource which you can then spend specifically on the mercenaries. That way you're encouraged to use farms generally earlier than you would use them with basically every other civilization. Another Byzantine specific mechanic is a base building mechanic revolving around cisterns and aqueducts. You are encouraged to place cisterns in key strategic locations and connect them with aqueducts which give bonuses up to five levels. And it makes the influence mechanic meaningful in a different way compared to for example the Holy Roman Empire or the Abbasids or the Ayyubids who can simply extend their influence just by building more buildings. All the new mechanics make Byzantium a very fun new civilization to play as. I have not even talked about all of the other uh, minutiae of the civilizations that they have, their landmarks, which are all pretty cool in their own ways. However, I do not want to make this review overly long. Now that we've finished overviewing the civilization, let us focus on the campaign. There is only one campaign in the Sultan's Ascent, comprised of eight missions. The Defense of Tyre, Into Egypt, Raiders of the Red Sea, the Horns of Hatin, the Battle of Mansurah, the Battle of Ain Jalut, the Siege of Acre, and the Invasion of Cyprus. And I will be real. On the gameplay side of things, all of those missions were extraordinarily fun. 
And in addition to that, they have definitely upped the difficulty of the campaigns, which was noticeable to me with the very first mission in particular, because in the very first mission, the defense of Tyre, you start off first with a squad of horse archers where you're supposed to stop the Franks as they called the crusader armies even though not all of the crusaders were Franks that is just how the Arabs of the time called them and uh, after that you get a base with relatively few resources and you're supposed to train an army to help uh, defend Tyre against a huge siege tower that is very very heavy to destroy and I will be real initially I was destroyed and I ended up lowering the difficulty at that point because I wanted to also enjoy the campaign but I think I have found a good strategy to do that specifically you build several production buildings in Tyre because there is a part of Tyre in which you can actually build buildings and from there you should train your army which will let you have a larger army that is uh, better suited to defending Tyre. What I really liked about this mission was that it was already showing that uh, the developers at Relic were thinking of how to make different gameplay missions compared to the previous missions and they have succeeded. It was very clear even in the first mission and it will be clear with the missions after that. For example, the mission into Egypt has no base building at all, you only get reinforcements every so often and you're supposed to take several key locations across the map that would aid your cause and eventually if you're able to keep all or most of those points and if you're able to take control of enough points for a long enough time you would essentially win the map because the enemies would retreat because you have managed to achieve dominance in Egypt and it was a very different type of map compared to everything else that I have played so far in Age of Empires 4 and uh, I would definitely give props to the way that they have done it. It also very much reminded me of Relic's other franchise Company of Heroes in a very very good way. On to Raiders of the Red Sea the short summary of that map is that it is a naval focused gameplay map in which you're supposed to defend trade and trade ships across the Red Sea, so from Egypt to Arabia and uh, both your town and several other allied towns as well. It is a map that takes a little bit to really get going, however it was a very very good thing the first uh, take of actually naval focused missions in the franchise and I hope they do more of these kinds of missions because I think that they have struck a goal so to say with this mission and I believe that they can make other naval focused missions interesting as well and I hope to see more of those in the future. When it comes to the horns of Hatim that was an interesting mission because it is the most gimmicky mission of the entire campaign. I wasn't on board with it in terms of the mechanic because even though the mechanic of setting a part of the grass and the forest on fire is a really cool mechanic. Uh, Technically, it is something that did not quite work like that historically and that took me a bit out of the gameplay side of things even though it was really fun to see large enemy armies defeated by smaller armies after they would encroach on grass and land that's on fire. It was really funny to watch and it was a good gameplay mechanic. I did enjoy it. I am going to move on to one of my favorite missions of the campaign, which would be the Battle of Mansura. And the reason why it is my favorite mission of the campaign is because you use spies in it. First, you get a tutorial in which you play as the spy in a shorter area to get a message out so that 
your main uh, base gets reinforcements later you get the base you're supposed to defend it but in the meantime you get an optional mission in which you can kill the leaders of the three main crusader orders the teutonic order the order of the knights hospitaller and uh, and the map is constructed in such a way that it allows you to do that but you have to pay very close attention to your spy you could technically assassinate all three of the enemies at once however i would say that that is very hard to pull off and it would require a lot of skill that said it is something that i will probably attempt to do at some point in the future because it sounds like a lot of fun trying to get all of my spies in the proper locations and then executing a three-prong strike at the same time and i just think it's a, a really really fun gimmick that uh, i hope to see more in some way or the other in the future as well the actual base building part is nice it's uh, as usual you could say and uh, once you manage to get those three orders out of the picture, uh, achieving the main objective is way easier. I assume also that there will be challenge runs in which the players will try to achieve the main objective without actually destroying the Crusader orders. After the Battle of Mansura comes a much simpler mission in the form of the Battle of Ain Chalut which is a battle against the Mongols in this case and in one way also the Crusader the Orders and it is a very flat map more or less in which you are trying to defend a village from being attacked it is meant to be a trap for the Mongol armies in which you're supposed to defend that valley with fewer supports against the numerically superior Mongols I thought that the actual defeat mechanic being losing all of the villagers would be very interesting because it made sure that you did not defend inside the village but outside of it and try not to let any enemy units actually approach and you had to be very careful with how you composed your armies because they came essentially uh, in three lines with different army compositions uh, between the center and the flanks and uh, you have to be very efficient with how you use your units otherwise you will lose but the whole fun is in finding out what is the best composition against the numerically superior forces that you're supposed to defeat and onto the penultimate mission the siege of Acre in my opinion it is the mission that should have been the final mission of the campaign because in it you get the special catapults which you can essentially get rocks from heaven to destroy parts of a wall or enemy units for a price of stone and that whole mechanic is really fun because it looks so funny and so cool the Siege of Acre actually has a lot of other cool things about it from the naval side of things in which you are at a huge disadvantage but you can still make a fleet even to defeat the Genoese fleet that will reinforce the main fleet at Acre to be able to destroy the fortresses to the base building and also using the stone from nearby ruins to fund your um, artillery strikes all of that is very good and that makes that map so cool and so fun and in comparison to that the final map the invasion of cyprus is not quite there uh, the invasion of cyprus is a much more standard map that uh, you have a base that you acquire after defeating some enemies which you need to build up more and more you have several side objectives to defeat and then you have to destroy the final buildings of uh, the enemies on that map and well it is still a very good mission it does not quite feel like the final mission in a campaign like the siege of Acre however I would still say that I really enjoyed the invasion of Cyprus and I would say that you would also enjoy it too
Lastly, when it comes to the positives, despite what people might think, I would say that this is a decently well-presented story that is coherent from start to finish and that it tells a perspective that is not often seen in Western media, aka the perspective of the Muslim world against the Crusades, and I say against for a reason, because obviously they were not fans of the Crusades, and they were not uh, in favor of just letting a bunch of uh, Christians uh, conquer a lot of their lands, and uh, that is very much presented in the story, and that is where we end with the positives. Unfortunately, the story is the main reason why I don't enjoy the campaign as much as I would have liked to. Specifically, I do not enjoy its story presentation. Although the campaign has done a lot of things, it has also not done a lot of things, and that was, I am sure, by design. One of those was the lack of documentaries and specific historically written pages from history that I so enjoyed in the original campaigns. It was a huge shame not to have that. And that was one of the things that left me with a sour taste in my mouth when I played this campaign because the documentaries were one of my favorite things about the original campaigns and they were just not there. They were not there at all. Not even the pages from history were told in a more historical way, they were also told from the perspective of the narrator, who I will talk about a bit more later. Even the masteries for the new civilizations did not have certain tidbits about those civilizations as rewards, which I found very disappointing and it lessened my enjoyment of the entire experience. I want to talk about presenting the story in a historical way and in the way of historical fiction. Neither of those, to be clear from the onset, are better or worse than the other. However, one of the things that I also enjoyed less in Age of Empires 2 was the historical fiction type presentation that the game went when it came to its story. It was told through a certain narrator who had a very clear bias, who would then talk about the objective and the enemy in no uncertain terms. Their side are the good guys, they are perfect, while the enemies are always evil and terrible. Thank you for watching. And that is not actually a bad thing. It is something that works well and that is why historical fiction is a very popular genre. However, it is simply not the way I enjoy my story, especially not in Age of Empires 4, because we already have examples of how Relic did actual historical content that may have been quote-unquote drier, but it was also very, very interesting, at least to me, although I am biased in that, considering that I went to university for history and English. And I also understand the reason why the developers at Relic decided to go with the historical fiction style of presentation. Just about every single review out there, except maybe one or two, were like, where is the drama? Why don't I have drama in this game? It is uh, very dry. I was not engaged with the historical side of things if there wasn't anything else to grab me with. And back in the day, when I was still not a streamer or a YouTuber, I was really, really annoyed at that, and I'm still annoyed at that fact, especially because, to me, when I put it in, like, from my perspective, I just think of how many cool documentaries they could have made about the armies 
of the Ayyubid Sultanate, the Mamluk Sultanate, the way uh, the Muslim world worked, why they were so united or disunited against the Crusades, the pages from history about certain characters. There was literally only one character, uh, Shajar al-Dur, who got a specific page from history from the narrator of the Sultan Sassan campaign that felt like it actually told an actual historical fact about her that was enjoyable to read. And that is a shame. That is to me a really big shame. And it is why I feel those reviewers and players who felt like that just did not understand the appeal of having a more historical approach to storytelling and essentially I would ideally like for Relic to, if not retroactively, add that content for the Sultan's Ascent that they continue with the historical style presentation in future content that they make for this game. Admittedly, another reason why they may have gone with the historical fiction presentation is because there is less budget to be had for creating new single-player content and that is understandable, still disappointing and I still think that the effort should be made but again, that is how I feel about this and it is not necessarily something that is shared with the wider player base. As a final point here, I want to talk about the narrator, aka the chronicler, who presents this heavy bias towards the Muslim side of things of the Crusades. And as I said before, I actually thought that that was very well executed. Spilling over into Nuruddin's realm. And so, into Egypt, marched the army of Damascus with Esad al-Din Shirkuh at its head, charged with settling the festering turmoil and expelling the Franks. And I think that his uh, way of presenting the story also makes sense in a historical fiction style of things, in the fact that he had his wife and child captured and enslaved by crusader pirates. And again, it makes sense, but my issue wasn't with the bias or the way he talked about the Crusaders. None of that, like, I was fine with all of that. No, my problem was simply that I would have preferred the Chronicler to be more historical in the way he talked, and that is all. Like, I cannot really say much more. That would not be repeating the same things over and over again. I very much endorse the idea of expanding the co-op mode way more than it is currently available because I think that looking up to StarCraft 2's co-op mode is something that would work very much in the game's favor for its longevity and retaining casual players into the main player base because even though the current co-op system, it makes sense, it functions well, however, it is not necessarily as engaging as an objective-based co-op system would be. We already have a decent amount of uh, civilization variety, so essentially what I think would be necessary is to use the campaign maps and adapt them to the co-op uh, mission setting. Using the defense of Tyre as an example, you could have the two players have bases near the neutral uh, AI base that we're supposed to defend. And then, uh, you know, we do the standard thing, building up, uh, creating all of the things that we need to make, like the army, the economy, to be able to sustain a defense against a huge enemy war machine and a large swath of enemy units that are going to destroy the neutral base unless we do something about it 
and just that idea itself sounds really really fun to me besides the battle of Ain Jalut or the horns of Hatin I think most of the Sultan's Ascent campaign maps can be used in a co-op mission style setting for example into Egypt as well it sounds like an amazing tug of war between two three or four players across the vast map with a lot of capture points and not just the neutral player armies that work in your favor there is so much that you can explore with that idea i hope that developers at relic take notice of this and perhaps implement it in the future because such a co-op mode is extremely fun and as uh, someone who has used to play starcraft 2 in particular very heavily in terms of 1v1 ladder uh, i have basically completely switched to co-op because in part my priorities shifted but also i have found the co-op engaging enough in that game to be able to want to play it for a very very long time while the current co-op system in age of empires 4 while fine is not quite as engaging or rather it could be made way more engaging by giving another sub mode in which players work to complete certain objectives in maps that are based on campaign or wholly unique maps which i know that relic can do considering how well they have made the campaign maps let me show you the final score that i'm giving to the sultan's ascent campaign it is an 8 out of 10. as much as i complain about the story presentation objectively the story was done in a decent and coherent way and as such i cannot really dock it any points besides that personally it wasn't as engaging as a more historical style presented story would have been the gameplay side of things is amazing, from the new civilizations, including the variant civilizations, and all of the campaign missions. I was very entertained by the gameplay, and that is why I think this expansion deserves a high score. It would have been a higher score if there were some documentaries at least, and it would have been an 11 out of 10 if it kept the whole historical style of things. However, without that, I have to give it an 8 out of 10, and I hope that it is a review that uh, you will have enjoyed watching. And speaking of that, thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon. Uh, I usually stream on Twitch, link here on the screen as well as in the description below. Please like, share and subscribe, and uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye!